Professor Gerd Weinberg, thank you very much for joining us today here at UNC Chapel Hill. And of course, you are Professor Emeritus here at UNC, but I'm very grateful that you made it again today. Um, there's a certain fascination for Hitler and the Nazis and for right-wing movements which we can observe at present. So let me ask you maybe a few more general questions. Why did Hitler come to power? Why did no one try to avoid him coming to power? Well, I mean, there were substantial numbers of people in Germany who voted against him and who didn't want him to come to power. But uh, by 1933, his political party had the support of the largest single number of people in the country of any political party. And uh, under those circumstances, the then president was persuaded to call him under the provisions of the Constitution, in effect, at the time, to be chancellor. And he then very quickly managed to consolidate power and shift himself, if you will, from being a constitutional chancellor mm -hmm. to being a dictator of the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did Hitler also have a good side? It was often claimed that Hitler wasn't all bad. He built the German autobahn. So was he also a good person? He liked dogs and children, I believe. Well, there's no question. He had a very favorite dog, though he arranged to poison it before he committed suicide. And uh, he was always courteous to his immediate secretaries and assistants. In that regard, well, no question about it. But he could also be exceedingly ruthless and nasty. And... Uh, Uh, one, and the people in the country were prepared to tolerate something that most people around the world would not. I ask you to think about what the reaction in this country would have been in the summer of 1934 if President Roosevelt and his predecessor, President Hoover, and his wife killed. And Hitler, without the Holocaust, Hitler, without the Second World War, would be just an ordinary politician? No, he wouldn't, because the, those were the things he wanted power for. That is to say, these were not coincidences. He had promised the German people in his speeches that he would lead them where they would need to shed their blood. There was nothing secret about the persecution of Jews. It's so interesting, for example, that in November of 1938, when the Jewish houses of worship were destroyed, Most of the German newspapers had instructions to put pictures on the front pages of the newspapers so that everybody who by some chance missed knowing this could see. We tend to forget that the regime was proud of what it was doing. Thank you. Are you concerned at all about the nationalistic developments we see in the contemporary world? There are some such developments in Hungary, for example. There are also right-wing elements in Ukraine, which people are concerned about. Is that... Is there a reason for concern? Is that, are these just passing phenomena? Well, there's, there's always a reason for concern because there is no way to tell whether the vast mass of the public will have sense enough to turn away from this and leave uh, these people who are so extreme out there on the fringes where there are some in every country on earth, but in most countries they don't. Uh, get anywhere. But could there be the rise of another Hitler? Maybe not in Germany, but in Hungary, in countries like... That's always possible. Uh, it would be a mistake, I would argue, that there's some kind of a German gene that nobody else has and that this could only happen with an Austrian in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, that if people want it, they get it, what, regardless of where it is. <laughs> Let me ask you, is nationalism bad as such? Or what is good nationalism? What is bad nationalism? Because in all countries, in the Western world also, including the United States and France and Britain, there are some very strong nationalistic feelings. But what is bad about it? What is good about it? Well, what is good about it is that it provides for a kind of cohesion in the society especially when the society gets into trouble. It is that the patriotism leads the people to rally in support, whether that's a natural disaster or a 
political or military or economic disaster. Cohesion is necessary for a society, and uh, during the course of the 19th century, cohesion shifted from the dynastic to the national principle. Uh, that doesn't mean that a, a dynastic principle is inherently bad. I'm not suggesting that. But the national principle came to replace it. And it seems to me that it has important advantages. So how do we say where the where is the borderline? Which sort of nationalism is bad? Which one is acceptable? Well, I would, I would argue that it is bad when it tries to step onto the toes of other people's nationalism. But as long as people stay within their realm and cooperate as best they can and help those other countries that they feel uh, aligned with for one, any one of a number of reasons, I would argue that it can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And last not least, What are the lessons from the 1930s? Are there any lessons we can learn and which are still important for our, the world of today? I would argue the point that I made in my talk is that people act on what they think. Not what you think or what I think, but mm -hmm. what they think. And we are very often unwilling to believe that others will act on intentions which they proclaim that we find preposterous, but they believe in. And it is the, the great lesson, I would argue, is to drop at least some of our cynicism that all politicians say what they do not, don't believe what they say and don't intend what they say they intend. I think that's a very dangerous attitude. Uh, I'm not saying they're all always truthful. But I think it's very important, and one of the major lessons of the 30s is to accept the notion that if somebody has ideas which we consider preposterous, that doesn't mean they don't really believe them. Thank you. That's a good point. And Professor Gerd Weinert, thank you very much for joining us today and for passing on your insights. Thanks a lot.